Good morning, church. Glad you're here today. I have uh, hope and pray that you had a great Christmas and a really good New Year. I sometimes look on Facebook, see where... I know some of you have been taking vacations, and that's great. And, and uh, here we are back, and uh, I'll tell you what, I've, I try not to ask people how they're doing. I just try to say, you know, I'm just glad you're here, because you never know what people are going through, but I'm glad you're here today. Let's uh, bow our heads once again as we talk to our King. Father in heaven, we're so grateful to be here because of your amazing grace, and I pray that as we continue this series that you'll help us to see the true picture of what it means to live in this grace. I ask again that you just make me a nail on a wall and hang a beautiful, shining picture of your son's face in his place. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. If you're watching online, we just want to thank you for being here also. I uh, want to start with a little story of a guy by the name of Wade Miller, and Wade Miller lived in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He was all excited that the Olympics were coming to Atlanta in 1996, and he was a volleyball fan. He wanted to get tickets, so he calls to the ticket agency right here in Atlanta, or there in Atlanta, and uh, they were available. So everything went smoothly until they asked for his address. Uh, Sir, we're sorry. She came back, said, just a moment, I'll be right back. Said, sorry, we, we cannot sell tickets to someone who does not live in the United States. He said, look, I live in Santa. For the next 30 minutes, he tried to convince her that New Mexico had been a part of the 48 contiguous states uh, since 1912, all right? And so still... Finally, the, the superintendent gets on, and she's just as adamant as the ticket seller. He says, look at sir, we cannot sail to someone outside of the United States. He said, have you ever heard of Albuquerque, New Mexico? Sir, we know you're a territory. We don't, uh, you know, want to judge you, but here, here's the deal, that you're not in the United States. And we, he said, look, look at New Mexico, emphasis on New Mexico. I don't care, New Mexico, Old Mexico, it's still the same. We cannot give you tickets thinking that he would not get those tickets because they were available, he, he quickly devised a plan. He had just moved from Phoenix, Arizona. He says, would you send him to this address in Phoenix? That saved the day. In fact, a man by the name of Scott Anderson, who is managing director of the Olympic Committee, calls Wade Miller personally and apologizes to him and all of New Mexico. But what's a guy to do if no one believes you? In fact, what is God to do? What if you're God and no one believes you? Because that's exactly what happened. Even believers who say they believe still don't believe him. I know I've been caught in the lie. I've fallen for it more than once. In fact, this lie is of such cosmic dimensions that has affected every one of us here in this room and on this planet. Because even though we know, in fact, in theory, we sometimes believe this, we still can't get it. And it's this gift of grace, my grace is all you need. I know, it just seems like, you know, we still got to do something. I mean, it can't just be free. We've got to earn our salvation somehow, somehow put in work, somehow, even though we just, we don't think we are, we slip in some kind of way that we're involved in our salvation. And God is saying over and over and over again to all of us, my grace is all you need. My grace is what you need and all you need. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. In fact, years ago, I was preaching on this subject of grace, and this lady came up to me, and she says, you can't preach that kind of grace. Our young people are going to go footloose and fancy free. They're going to think that all you have to do is love Jesus and, and do as you please. You know, it's interesting that she said that love Jesus and do as you please. And I said, hey, let me turn to a verse of Scripture. I turned to John 14 and 15, and it says, if you love me, you're going to do what, I, what pleases me. Do you know what it says that? If you love me, you're going to be obedient because you love me. And so if you love God, do as you please because you're going to want to please the God that pleases you. Amen. And so when we understand this, this theme of grace in its right, right perspective, in its context, that we are going to be so caught up in the gift of His grace that we're going to do everything we do, it, we're going to want to please Him. And what pleases him will please us too. And this is so important that we understand this. Grace, in fact, I love this, this statement by Andrew Womack. He says, grace doesn't cause people to live in sin. It frees them from the paralyzing effects of guilt and condemnation so they can live holier, listen, accidentally now, 
than they ever did on purpose before. Why? Because as a result of your living in grace, you don't have to try to be obedient. It's a result of your, your love relationship with this man called Jesus. And this is so important that we understand that. In fact, uh, sometimes we have to unlearn. It's kind of like Yoda, <laughs> kind of like Yoda in Star Wars. You have to unlearn what you've learned. And many of us have grown up in maybe a church or a home situation where it was rules and the do's and the don'ts, and, and you have to find a way to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, and, and you're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to figure it out. But then when we really truly discover grace, and the beauty of this, we never, we never want to fall out of His grace. And this is why grace for grace. When we receive this grace, we want to give this grace. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 7, it says, Because of His grace, He made us right in His sight and gave us confidence. Now, this word is also assurance in other translations, that we will inherit eternal life. So we have this assurance. We don't have to have any kind of fear. We don't live in fear. We live in the assurance that we have received His gift of eternal life. And this is what brings joy to the Christian. The real joy is knowing that we have confidence in what He's already given us, and because of His grace, we've received this eternal life. Um, I have learned over the years, most people will not let the Word of God stand in the way of what they believe. Let me say that again. Most people are not going to let the Word of God stand in the way of what they believe. It kind of goes like this. They will change their theology to meet their experience, their lifestyle. Ah, it doesn't, doesn't match up with the way I live, and so they'll try to, try to twist the Word of God to meet their standard, their way of life. It's very dangerous, folks. A lot of people do it. I've done it in the past. I didn't believe, I didn't believe that grace was all I needed. And you know, it is, it is a danger to think, hey, we are saved by grace alone because we're not saved by grace alone. We're saved by grace through faith. They come together. They come together. Now, we're going to learn in this message today that receiving grace from God but refusing to give it to others isn't an option. This is from Kyle Eidelman. I gathered some thoughts from him today. But here's why it's so important that we understand that this grace, this grace is not just about living a right kind of life. It's living in Christ that helps us to live the right kind of life. Now, I believe that the commandments are important, and I've often said this. It's kind of like a mirror. It shows us our great need of Christ. And there was a lady I was reading in Ohio. She was a school teacher of one of these little uh, church schools, uh, parochial school, and she uh, was trying to teach her kids the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. And all week long, they had studied really hard, and at the end of this, the, the week, she was going to test them. And she decided to do something a little different, a little case study, okay? So she, she called the kids together. She says, okay, boys and girls, um, and they were all different ages in, in that one-room classroom. In fact, I taught in Lake Tahoe 15 kids, grades 1 through 8, and I had eight first graders. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Teaching them phonics and math and everything. But uh, anyway, she says, okay, boys and girls, here's a little story for you. We're going to learn the Ten Commandments through a story. Johnny and Susie, a part of a family, they, uh, mom and dad said, hey, we're going we're to go to town. Anyone want to go? And Susie said, I want to go. Johnny said, I'd like to stay home. Okay, Johnny, what you need to do is do your homework, and we'd like you to do the dishes too, and then you can watch TV, all right? So they get back home, and guess what? Johnny's watching TV, but he didn't do his homework, and he, he didn't do the dishes. Okay, boys and girls, what commandment did he break? Hand goes up, a young scholarly hand just shoots up and says, I know, teacher. He actually broke two. Honor your mother and your father. Plus, he lied because he said he'd do his homework. And he'd do the dishes. He didn't. Very good, very good. All right, so the next one is, while they're out shopping, little Susie sees some candy and she slips it in his pocket, her pocket and doesn't pay for it. Which one is that? Another quick hand goes up. Jimmy, what is it? Susie, thou shalt not steal. 
course thou shalt not steal. Now, how do you teach the Tenth Commandment? Does anyone know what the Tenth Commandment is? Thou shalt not covet. So how do you teach that to kids? So she says, okay, later on in the evening, just before going to bed, uh, Johnny and Susie are looking at their, their coin collections, and Susie has her spread out, and Johnny wants one of those coins. He really wants it bad. It's a silver dollar. He says, I want that coin. She won't give it to him. I want that coin. They're arguing. In fact, he, he wants it so bad, he runs out of her room. He grabs the cat in one arm, and he's got the tail in the other. And he says, if you don't give me that coin, I'm going to pull the tail off of this cat. Oh, the kids, their eyes are open, their mouths are hanging down. He says, you know, what, what kind of a commandment is that? Finally, one boy raises, I know, teacher, what God has brought together, let no one pull us under. <laughs> I don't know if that's in the Ten Commandments. That's a new one to me. But here's something that we need to understand about grace. Because you can't pull them apart. It is faith and grace together. And let's look at it in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace through faith. They have to go together. God offers you grace, but you must accept it through faith. It's that simple. Through a faith relationship with Christ. In fact, I've said this before. It's so important that we need more reminding than we do instructing. The only fight... Did you know the Bible only talks about one fight in all of Scripture? It's not to fight for your salvation. It's to fight the fight of faith to stay in relationship with Christ. So this faith, it is by grace, through faith, you have been saved, already been saved. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift, the gift of God. Not by works, so no one can boast. So no one can boast. In fact, Paul is always talking about how he cannot boast about this grace and about this amazing gift that he's been given, and none of us can too. This grace, this grace is so amazing. This grace is greater than your sins. It's greater than your failures. It's greater than your faults. It's greater than your hardships. It's greater than your guilt your condemnation, and your shame. This great grace is so amazing. You know what the problem with grace is? The problem with grace is I could stand up here and I can talk to you about grace. I can try to explain it, but it has to be experienced. You, can't, you cannot know what grace is until you actually experience it. And this is the problem and the beauty of grace. The problem and beauty of grace. So Paul says in chapter 11, this is in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty. 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Now, Paul is always talking about weakness. Why is it? Because of God's grace, he realized that in his weakness, that's where he finds his strength. He has to rely on God more and more and more. Have you found that in your life? That, that you have to, find, if you try to go on your own strength, you fall apart, but when you, you fall on Jesus, you discover his grace more and more. In fact, in chapter 12, in verses 1 and 2, it says, I will reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Now, what's the third heaven? Well, there was the atmosphere, then there was the stars, and then there's the very dwelling of God. Okay, so that's the third heaven. He was caught up to the third heaven. Notice how long ago? 14 years ago. This is the first time he mentions this. Did you know that? Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding. This word in the original language, so astounding, there's not a word in the English language that can actually match it. So he's so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. That, that kind of caught my attention. No human being is allowed to tell this, all right? Maybe that's why he didn't tell us. That experience is worth boasting about, but I'm not going to do it. I am kind of like how I, just, just a, a, a moment of transparency here. If, if I had been caught up in the third heaven, uh, you'd be hearing about it the next Sabbath. <laughs> I'd, I'd be working it into a series here, you know, how I was caught up into the third heaven, all right? I'd be on Instagram right away, you know. I was caught up in the third heaven and uh, hashtag no, no filters. I mean, I would just be throwing this out there at everyone. I mean, I'd be on Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, WeChat, TikTok, Snapchat, Reddit, Skype, Quora, Twitter, QQ, Telegram. I'd even let LinkedIn in on it. I mean, I would make certain no, everyone knew... In fact, I would write a book, you know, why God chose me and not you. I, I, mean, 
I, w- I would make certain in every conversation, every conversation, it would be about, hey, you know, um, yeah, when I was caught up in the third heaven, and I would, I would make certain that my bio, if I were ever to speak anywhere, uh, we have Dave Kettleson here from, uh, who, who had been caught up in the third heaven, you know, but Paul never mentions it for 14 years. He only mentions it to mention it that he's not going to mention it. He only tells us that he's not going to tell us about it. Maybe because God erased it from his memory, or maybe because of this line right here, no human is allowed to tell. No human. In fact, even if he did tell us, maybe we wouldn't even be able to comprehend it. This amazing third heaven. I would love to know what he experienced there. But Paul never mentions it. Paul, Paul himself, he, do you know in almost every 14 epistle, he says, grace and peace, a slave in Christ. A slave in Christ. You know why he says slave in Christ? Because a slave doesn't have a resume. The slave is only known because of their master. And this is what Paul wants us to know, his master. That's it. To be a nail on a wall and hang a beautiful, shiny picture of God's face. That's all he wanted to do. And I'm not really good at that. Even though I say that, I, I fall into that trap. We all do. Oh, it's try to weave self into it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan. Now notice it's from Satan. It's not from God to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Now sometimes we get a thorn in the flesh. And I don't know what yours is, but he he had he had received this thorn. Notice that it wasn't from God, but he allowed it, and he didn't take it away. And this is very important for us as Christians to understand. Sometimes these things that we just want removed from our lives, they're not from God, but he'll allow them to continue. Why? In verse 8, it says, three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Three different times he begged. Now, I think he asked many, many times, but three times he begged. I mean, he's just on his knees, crying, begging God to take it away from me. Have you ever been there? Lord, take this away. You know, the mention three times, three times is mentioned actually 476 times in Scripture. Uh, Daniel prayed three times a day. Jesus prayed three times, remember, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Peter denied Jesus three times. Jesus said, feed my sheep three times. Samuel was called three times. And over and over and over, we find these three times. But uh, Paul was begging that it would be taken away. But what does God say? My grace. My grace is all you need. Is all you need. Now, I have read all kinds of commentaries on what this thorn that was in his flesh might be. Some say that it was a deformity because in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter around 8 through 10, he talks about how uh, his, his appearance was a distraction and an obstruction to many people. They didn't like to look at him. And when you're beaten that many times and you are stoned that many times, um, I'd imagine that, you know, without plastic surgery, Paul really kind of looked, you know, maybe scary, especially to little kids. I read a commentary about how he was probably short, bald-headed, and bull-headed, and that uh, he had a limp, and that he had scars on his face from all the, the rocks that had been pummeled on him. You know, one time he was drugged out of the city of, of uh, Lyconium. They thought he was dead. They stoned him, bleeding, bloody mess, and they, st- they, they pull him out, think that he's dead. Then he comes back. They see him preaching the next day. He's still speaking. And he said, we thought we killed you. Yeah, but he said, I hadn't, I hadn't finished my sermon yet. You know? <laughs> Paul was tenacious. And then he says, my power, my power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ is going to work through me. That's how it happens. It's not me or you. It's Christ through us. Some say that he had epilepsy. In fact, in, in, in Galatia, he talks about how um, there were people who thought that epilepsy and demonic possession were almost the same thing, and they would spit on them. And one time when Paul went to Galatia, he said, I want to thank you for not spitting on me. I mean, that's kind of a random thank you note. <laughs> hey, thank you everyone for not spitting on me today when I came into town. 
But some people think that he actually had epilepsy. Others think that maybe because of Galatians chapter 6, right at the beginning, he says, I'm writing to you, you'll notice the large print, that he had poor eyesight. And so he had larger print, it's not my scribe. Others think it was migraines or speech impediments, stomach problems, but he never mentions it. Why? Why does he never mention those thorns? Probably because the same reason he never mentions why he was in the third heaven. Because it's not about him. And also, too, there's a metaphor here. There's a metaphor. That thorn could be your thorn. See, maybe that thorn, you beg God to take it away, and he, he says, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to take it away. I'm going to let it stay there. Because it keeps you humble. And you realize how weak you are, you depend more on my strength and not yours. Because grace is greater than your pain. Grace is greater than your sickness or your disability. Grace is greater than the conflict you have at work. Grace is greater than your problem child or your, pro your child with problems. Grace is greater than the divorce you're going through, the habit you can't seem to break, the addiction that you just can't overcome. Grace is greater than because grace will give you the power to overcome. We hide our weaknesses. We exploit our strengths. Years ago, I read a book called Strength Finder from Gallup. <laughs> it's a good book. And there's assessment tests that you can take, and you can find out your five greatest strengths. And it kind of makes you feel good about it. Oh, these are my five greatest strengths as a leader. Um, you know, Paul, Paul, if he were to write a book, he might write a book called Weakness Finder. I mean, he kind of did in, in Galatians and 2 Corinthians and Romans. My weakness, weakness, weakness. He's always talking about his weakness. Weakness. I don't think it would be a number one bestseller, but it actually is. If you've ever read the book of Romans and Corinthians. But if you really listen to Paul, he says, don't run from your weakness, but embrace it, because that's where God's power is on display. I don't, uh, I don't know why Paul continues his theme on this, but somehow he, he realized that the more he dwelt on his weakness, the more he dwelt on God's strength. And he says, here, that's why, that's why I take pleasure, notice, pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardship, persecutions, and troubles that, suffer, that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Then I'm strong. I don't know if you've ever read anything by Corey Ten Boone. Any of you ever read The Hiding Place or watch The Hiding Place? You know, this, this lady, Dutch, but she, they, her family hid the Jews in their home. They were, caught, they were put into concentration camp. Her sister, Betsy, was, died in the concentration camp. And she tells her story, an amazing story. But, but uh, after they're released, she's, she's sharing her story. And one day she's staring, sharing a story on grace and forgiveness. And she sees him. He's bald-headed, he's a big man, and he had one of the guards. Now, he didn't recognize her, but she recognized him. And after she had given this beautiful presentation on forgiveness, she said she had a hard time forgiving that man. That stood right there as she, as she was preaching forgiveness and grace. She just, she just couldn't find it in her heart. And she said, Lord, only you can. And the man actually walked up to her, not recognizing her. And he says, I was so moved by your story. He says, I was a guard at one of the concentration camps. And, and, and people like you, I treated, mistreated. And he broke down and cried. And he extended his hand and asked for her forgiveness. She said, I couldn't, I couldn't reach out and hold his hand. But God told me to. He says, I want you to extend as much grace to him as I've extended to you. And she broke down and she took that hand. She said that something like an electrifying fudge went all through her body. And she said she had never experienced grace like that. And she forgave him because God had asked her to. She says she wasn't willing at first, but once she, she just reached out her hand because God told her to, it happened. Maybe there's someone here today that they, they just can't reach out their hand in forgiveness and grace, and yet God is telling you, God has been telling you over and over and over, and yet today is that day. You need to extend that hand of grace and forgive. She's written a book called Tramp for the Lord, and it's a story of an old woman uh, when the Russians, in the time of communist persecution during the Cold War, and... Um, 
I read this story, maybe you've read it too, about, about she goes into this home of this lady, she's, she has multiple sclerosis, her body is twisted, she's propped up by pillows, her, her feet are curled up under her and her head is bent over and only one part of her body is working, it's her index finger on her right hand. There's a typewriter next to her. Her elderly husband is, is catering to her every need, and, and she is typing slowly, one peck at a time on that typewriter, translating the Bible into their language so that people in their village and other people could actually get the message of the gospel. As she's watching this man, he, he tells her of how sometimes it takes her a long time to just get one finger on the typewriter and she says that she, he noticed her anguish she, she, she blurts out inside of herself oh God why don't you do something and the husband kind of notices her anguish and he answers it for her he says God and I'm writing what she wrote God has a purpose in her sickness every other Christian in this city is watched by the secret police but because she has been sick for so long, no one ever looks in on her. They leave her alone. They leave us alone, and the, poli and the only person in the city that can type quietly, unexpected by the police, is her. Now, who would have thought that her multiple sclerosis would be a gift that she could use? Let me ask you, what is the one thing you would want removed in your life? What is the one thing you wish God would take away? Could it be, has it ever occurred to you that this one thing that you want removed could be the one thing that God is using for his greatest glory? And that's certainly in the case of Paul. He said, don't take away this thorn. I've asked many times, but now I realize it's your grace that all I need all I need. Max Licato says, we don't know all the circumstances of this thorn, but we do know that no one has articulated grace more beautifully than Paul. Because no one has appreciated grace more than Paul. See, only, only the, the, the hungry value of feast. And Paul was starving. And sometimes, you know, sometimes God would rather have us walk through life with a limp than a a perpetual strut. Because Paul knew that the, it was about the message, not the messenger. We're only a conduit. We're only an instrument being used by God. It's all about him. It's all about him. Do you know how, how it is to be used in the hands of God? It's both exhilarating and humbling. It really is. Sometimes we, we make mistakes and we realize that, oh, you know... I wish I could get out of this. Have you ever, ever done something you wish, oh, immediately, you wish, I, I had done it. And, and you ask for grace, and sometimes it comes through. Sometimes you think, oh, okay, I, I deserve this. <laughs> I deserve it. Oh, we were driving, um, I shared last week in the first, I forgot to second, share it in the second. We were driving down to uh, Florida, my wife and I, our family, and, and uh, we were stuck in traffic around Macon, Georgia. And uh, anyways, it was just, we just stopped. I don't remember, we were waiting in line maybe half an hour, and no one was moving. But I noticed there was an off-ramp, not too far, and I thought, you know, I could get off the off-ramp and go up and around. Have you ever done that? Only me? You know, like, I could pass all these cars. I could get off the off-ramp and go way up there. I'd probably pass, you know, at least, you know, a mile of people. And so I, I decided I'd do that. I had to get on the shoulder, you know, that white line, all those little... Brum, and so I'm, I'm driving over there, and people are not happy with me, but I thought, you know, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> so I'm, I'm driving over on the shoulder, and all of a sudden, there were other cars that had the same idea, and there was a cop waiting for us. I thought, oh, no. So he pulls us over, and he's writing everyone to take. I mean, there was no one getting out of the city. He gets to my window, and I thought, you know, I'm going to try something. It may not work, but I'm going to try it. Let's just see what happened. I said, you know, you know, officer, I said, before you write me a ticket, I deserve it. I mean, there's, there's no way I should get out of this ticket, but you know what? I'm a pastor, and um, I'm going to try to use my, I didn't tell him, I'm going to try to use my clergy class. I'm a pastor, and you know, I'm, I'm going to be preaching on grace this coming Sabbath. I wasn't really, but now I am. And so, <laughs> and, and you know what? I, I'm going to ask for grace. And, and I, if you would just give me grace. I, it would be so. I, I said, I'd even use you in a sermon illustration. He said, why should I, I not write you a ticket 
and I'm writing everyone else because they didn't ask. <laughs> I am. He said, I've never heard an excuse like this, but he says, I don't know why I'm going to do this, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to write you a ticket. So it worked. I want you to know it doesn't work every time because I've tried it again and it <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> but we always call on God's grace. We always call on God's grace. You know, Peter, one day, he came to Jesus because he, he, he knew about Jesus and, and the grace. That, you know, Jesus never used the word grace, but he was always so graceful to others. And, and Jesus, Peter and, and the other disciples, they were just ordinary people. Um, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary, ordinary men. And they were astonished, and they took note that they had been with Jesus, just ordinary men, just like you and I. So here's Peter. Peter, he comes to Jesus because I think, I'm not sure, but I think that there's someone that he had forgiven, you know, at least six times, maybe Maybe now it's going on seven. He's like, I'm through with this guy. I'm through with this guy. And so Peter came to him, Jesus, and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? You know, I think Peter was thinking, I think Peter was thinking, oh, Peter, this is, this is amazing. You know, uh, you always astound me, Peter. Just uh, here, you know, the, the religious leaders, it was three times. That's all you had to do, three times. You can look it up and Google it. It was three times. Peter's going to double it, add one for the perfect. That's my favorite number, Peter, seven. He puts his arm around. I wish all the disciples could be like you. I just, this is amazing. You're going to forget. No, Jesus doesn't do that. He says, nope, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70, 70 times seven. And then he tells this story. We're going to go through it rather quickly. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his servants was brought who owed him millions of dollars. Now, if you look in the commentary, there's one place where it says about 150 to 200 million dollars. So in other words, this is a story that Jesus is telling, look, there's, there's no way you can account for this. There's no way you can pay this back. This is, this is something that's just impossible. And there may be someone here today. You're having a hard time. Because, you know, as, as, soon, as soon as you realize it, there, there's no sorry big enough. There's nothing they can do. And this is where grace comes in. They cost you a childhood. They cost you a marriage. They cost you your job or your reputation. They hurt you so badly that there's no sorry. There's nothing they can do to make up for it. Nothing. It's not $200 million. It, it, there's nothing that could make up for it. And this is where grace comes in. And so the story goes on and says, he couldn't pay. So his master ordered, and this is why you and I cannot pay the debt. We cannot. So his master ordered him that he should be sold. Along with his wife, children, and everything he owed to pay the debt. And this is, this is what happened back in those days. Everyone sold into slavery. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, just like Paul did three times. <laughs> Please be patient with me and I'll pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Isn't that great? This is the good news. He forgave his debt. Clean slate. Isn't that a great story? You'd think that he'd go out and he'd do the same. You know, he was forgiven much. We, he should forgive others too. But it doesn't end there. We who have read the story. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him. He, did, he went to him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it all, he pleaded. But the creditor, in fact, that was the exact same words he asked the other, the king. But the creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid for. You know why this is so crazy? Because you see, when you take someone and you put them in prison, guess who pays the debt? You do. You pay for them being in prison. You're not going to get anything out of it. It just doesn't make sense. Verse 31 is a verse that we don't look at very carefully very often. It says, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Why? Because they lived in community and they saw this. They saw that this man had been forgiven and now he's not going to be forgiving. And so his fellow community, they didn't like it. And then the king, 
called the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Go to the next one. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man, and the angry king sent the man to prison until he had paid his entire debt. Now, how is he going to pay that? He, he can't pay it. That's, now listen, this is just scripture. I'm just reading scripture. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. This is how important it is to God. He says, even if it's in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew 18, if, if you come to the altar, if you come here and you, you come to church and you're going to give a gift to the Lord, you give an offering in the plate, he says, hey, listen, go and make it right with that brother. I'm not even going to accept your offering. offering until you do. Isn't that amazing? So, I close with the story. I close with this story about a guy named Tim Sharp. He's a pastor, and, and uh, he is he's going to have communion at his church, and uh, he has a couple of churches, and he just come from the one, and so everything uh, is going pretty good in the people's eyes, and yet they had no kind of an idea of what kind of week he had. You see, this pastor had just, during the week, he had been confronted by the Sabbath school superintendent uh, that particular morning, um, that uh, things were, were not going so well, that someone didn't do something for him, and that he was going to resign if uh, the pastor didn't clear that up. The kitchen was a mess, and someone had left it a mess, and so the people were complaining there. Crater roll, too, had not been cleaned, and they need to talk. There was also a couple in the church that uh, needed marriage counseling, and they were going to separate. There was a head elder who had, or an elder, not a head of, an elder who had infidelity, and he had to deal with that. There was also a situation where uh, some of the members were upset at some of the teens because they weren't behaving well enough in church, during church, they were on their cell phones and things like that, and so they were all upset, and he was going through all of this, and they were having communion, and, and finally, um, he noticed his boy standing in the doorway, his teenage son, his name was Tim also, and he went over to his boy, and he asked his son if anyone had served him. He'd already been served by an elder, he and the elder, and the son shook his head. And so he asked if he could serve his son. But what people didn't know is that earlier in the week, his son had borrowed the car and put a big old dent in his car. And he wasn't happy with his son. And here this pastor, he wouldn't talk to his son. And when they would meet each other at breakfast, they wouldn't talk to each other. They'd just pass. He'd go to school and he'd go to, to the church or wherever or do his duties or go up to his study. And he said, for two weeks, almost two weeks, we hadn't talked to each other. And now he's washing his feet. And he says at that moment that he just knew his heart wasn't right, he needed to forgive his son, and he asked God for the grace to do it. He says all of a sudden he noticed that his tears were dripping down into the warm water of that foot basin, and he felt so bad how he had not forgiven his son earlier. And as he's washing his son's feet, he tried to dry his tears where his son couldn't see or anyone else. And he was overcome with emotion. And God told him these words, you need to forgive your son just as much as I've forgiven you. And so he stood up and he grabbed his son by the shoulder and he hugged him really tight. And he says, son, you're more important to me than any old stupid car. He says, we'll get the den out, don't you worry. The son and him embraced, and the son knew that he was forgiven. For two weeks, that father held a grudge against his own son because of a dent in the car. He says, how frivolous. But he says, what I want to share with other people is that pastors need grace too, and our feet need washing too, and there's nothing more important than living in God's grace. Because when we live out of grace, we live in the guilt and the shame and the tumult of, of that separation of our Father. And we know, we know that sometimes we're actually the biggest sinner that there is. I sometimes look at my life and I think, Paul, you say you're the chief of sinners? No, actually, I, I think I am. Jean LaRoe says it this way. If the biggest sinner you know isn't you, 
You don't know yourself very well. Years ago, I would have fought against this. But the closer I come to Jesus, the more I realize that, yeah, I'm the biggest sinner I know because I know myself a whole lot better than you do. And I'm not going to tell you everything I've done wrong. You don't have to tell me everything you've done wrong. You know, if I told you everything I've done wrong, you probably wouldn't want to listen to me. But if I, you told me everything you've done wrong, I wouldn't even want to talk to you. So, you know, we're in the same boat. But here's what I do know. That God's grace is greater. God's grace is greater. And He knows everything that you and I have done. He knows. Maybe one of you have cheated on a test recently. He knows. He knows. Maybe you've embezzled some money. I'm, no one knows. Oh, yeah, He knows. Maybe uh, you flirted with that, that guy or that girl at the, at the uh, gym this week or recently. Well, spouse doesn't know, but he knows. Or maybe, um, maybe he knows the pride in your heart because I didn't mention anything that you did wrong and you're feeling pretty good right now. But he knows everything we've done. And God knows that you and I can't live outside of his grace and that grace is all you need and when you receive that grace you don't want to live outside of that grace because you're free from the guilt and the shame and the condemnation and Jesus wants to stay and remain in that grace it's all you need let's pray father in heaven thank you so much for that grace I pray that I'll live in that grace that we all will live inside of your grace yeah, there's some thorns in our lives. We know that. And we have begged at times for you to take it away. But maybe it's one of the, the best things that has happened to us to bring you glory. And so I pray that we will allow you to make the decisions for us. But may we never give up on your love and your forgiveness for us. And may we extend it to others to the extent that you've given it to us. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, You can be confident of one thing, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day Jesus Christ returns. Here at Hamilton, we exist to connect the disconnected by sharing Jesus through loving and serving and being a grace-filled church family. When you walk through our doors, we want you to feel right at home. It's our intention to make worship attractive and Christ irresistible. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, welcome to Children's Church. Good morning, welcome to Hamilton. Our service is about to start. Come join us now. It's time to worship. <laughs> 